asset class correlation is an element SMSF members must always consider when managing their fund portfolio. Anthony Murphy and Michael Houghton from Lucerne Investment Partners is with me today to discuss the importance of this issue. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Darren. Thank you, Darren. I might just start by asking why minimizing asset class correlation is so important. Well, thanks, Darren. The, the primary reason is you're, you're able to diversify away from uh, returns that are going to influence your portfolio. So if one market was to go in one direction and you're not correlated to that, then your returns are able to continue in the direction that you would like as a group, as, a, as an allocation overall across the portfolio. So if you're targeting a return of 7 or 8% per annum and you've got a large allocation to equities, for example, they're all going to go the same way at the same time, which is a high correlation. So you want to try and minimize as much of that as you can. And one of those ways is portfolio asset allocation and diversifying assets within that allocation. Now, Lucerne Investment Partners has actually got a product um, to provide a solution to ensure a segment of a portfolio has low correlation with equities, which is an asset class, as we all know, that's very popular among SMSF trustees. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. Well, Lucerne uh, has a fund called the Lucerne Alternative Investments Fund. Its primary objective is to invest in the alternatives asset space. Um, a lot of people hear the word alternatives and probably don't fully understand what it comprises. Um, and the simplest way that we look at it is that uh, equities, bonds, cash are your traditional asset class. Anything that doesn't fit within that is defined as an alternative investment. So that could include things like private debt, private equity, uh, real estate, digital assets, commodities, et cetera. So there's a lot of um, breadth to and a lot of investments that you're not participating in if you don't actually have alternatives in your portfolio. So the Lucerne Alternative Investments Fund does have an allocation across uh, all those asset classes. And it also, as a result, is able to achieve very strong, what we call risk adjusted returns. So for the return that you're getting, the risk you're taking is quite low. Um, for example, with our fund, uh, with the returns in 21 and 20 being above 20% for both those years, the risk was uh, uh, sitting at around six or 7% compared to the equities markets uh, with their volatility or risk sitting somewhere between 12 and 14%, depending on which year you're looking at. That would provide a lot of downside protection, wouldn't it? Which is very important. Yes, and the downside protection is uh, achieved through not only the allocation to alternative assets, but through the way that we've structured the portfolio, how we weight it, the decisions that we make on what assets we want to allocate to at what time. And uh, what you do see then is that the returns um, as each month unfolds, as uh, various things take place in the world markets, in macroeconomic geopolitical uh, issues, that the fund has underlying investments that will continue to perform as others may not, but overall it provides a solid, stable return profile for the fund. Now, recognising opportunities for the fund and balancing the portfolio within the fund is obviously very important. How do you recognise an emerging alternative asset and how do you know when to buy into it and when to sell it off? Yeah, I might take that one. So it's, it's a great question, Darren. And um, we obviously don't have a crystal ball, but the way LAFE's investment committee operates is we do take a top-down approach. So we consider, consider the macro environment first and foremost. And then based on our view of the macro environment, uh, we take into account um, thematics that we believe are emerging in the market that... Um, that instill tailwinds, and then we look at thematics in the market that potentially have headwinds. And then once you identify those thematics that you wish to own and the ones you wish to avoid, particularly on the ones you wish to own, we look at using that word again, what's the best risk adjusted way in which we want to own those assets. Um, so a couple of examples around that over the last couple of years would be um, resources. You know, we identified in early 2020 um, on the back of COVID that we felt the resources market was going to, to rally and rally quite strongly. Yeah, we could see that inflation was probably going to stick around on the back of the stimulus that was provided to global markets at the time. So um, we went on our merry way to um, you know, really analyse the resources space, identify you know, experts within that space that had good quality track record, 
And as a result of that, we actually seeded a new resources fund back in April 2020, uh, which for our investors has annualised 64% per annum over that period of time. Um, now, in terms of our view on resources, we actually still think that thematic's got a long way to play out at the moment. We think we're potentially at the start of a bit of a super cycle in that space. And so we're not looking to exit that strategy anytime soon. But as we start to see that thematic change and die down, we will start to actively reduce that exposure. And we can give you another live example when that happened um, not too long ago. Again, in early 2020, when COVID occurred, um, we looked at the thematic in terms of it was gonna be a lot more individuals at home in their households, um, potentially a lot of spare time on their computers and we thought, well, what's an emerging asset class in that space? And, and that was digital assets, uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain, DeFi. And so again, in what is quite a complex um, investment strategy, we identified a group um, in Melbourne that um, yeah, we felt were experts in the space. We were the very first institutional investor in their fund in February 2020. It was at least another 12 months later to really the broader market started talking about digital assets and crypto. Um, that fund did extraordinarily well for us in a short period of time. It was sized appropriately from a risk perspective, you know, one and a half percent of the fund, uh, but it did go up four times in that year. And then when the market started getting, um, well, it was hubris in the market regarding this asset class, uh, we took the view in mid-2021 to start reducing our allocation there as the hubris was absolutely evident. And we actually stayed within the asset class, but we moved to a different strategy with the same manager in digital assets that allowed us to more or less make a, a fixed income return in that space. And, and that's performed incredibly well as well. So it's how you actually own that asset class as well, which is just as important as um, defining the theme itself. Anthony, you did mention um, allocation to resources. Um, do you actually look at resources from the point of view that there are sub-asset classes that you have to invest in and out of as well during that, that portfolio management process? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I did sort of box resources all as one there, but if you look at the underlying portfolio in life at the moment, we actually have three separate resource strategies from the current 15 strategies that life's managing. Uh, one of those is in precious metals and gold. So we're focusing on silver and gold in that space, which historically has been quite a good hedge against inflation. You're really starting to see that um, come to fruition at the moment. Um, because inflation is not transitory, as central banks wanted us to believe last year. No. Um, it's far from it. In addition to that, um, was the global resources manager I mentioned before that is going into a lot of the sort of the precious metals, the lithium plays, um, the EV space, electric vehicles around the world. So that's a thematically supported there. And that's more in global equities. And then finally, we've invested in... Um, a convertible debt structure in the resources space where this um, this manager is able to actually go to listed companies or private companies in the resources space, provide them with debt, but has the ability to, to participate in equity upside um, should that company perform well. If it does not, the debt is repaid. And so there's three different strategies that we looked um, in that resources basket as a whole. So our resources allocation across the board at the moment would be just shy of 20% across the whole fund, but it's held through three very different strategies to really, um, to really dial down that volatility in the fund. And that's allowed us to um, protect downside risk. And, and that's the, re the one of the main drivers as to why LAFE has particularly performed so well in the last two years, we've been able to avoid large market drawdowns. Okay, to bring it back to an SMSF context, how can the use of the LAFE fund allow SMSFs to outperform other types of funds in the industry? Yeah, so to that point there, it's really on protecting capital um, when markets dislocate. So if you go back to you know Warren Buffett's rules of investing, what's rule number one? Don't lose capital. What's rule number two? See rule number one. And so if you go back to February, March 2020, when global markets dislocated and fell circa 30% or 40% at its intra-week high, um, LAFE over that same period was down 6%. So we're able to protect that capital then compound off a much higher base. And, um, you know, as Einstein said, you know, compound is the eighth wonder of the world. And so when you're thinking about from portfolio allocation perspective, from an equity basket is under pressure and being and, and cause and causing significant drawdowns in the portfolio, 
well then life's over here actually providing sort of some complementary support to that mm -hmm. um, our next big stress test was in january this year um, when the market woke up at the start of this year and thought this was all you know a little bit crazy we saw that dislocation again um, equity markets here were down about 6.3 percent and life was actually up 0.8 in January. So there are two really live periods in the last two years where markets have had significant short-term drawdowns and we've been able to stem the tide. And then again, repeating myself, but we're compounding off that, that higher capital base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, Darren, if I can just add to what Anthony said there for self-managed super funds, one of the key uh, things is actually accessing alternative investments. It's really difficult to uh, get into some of these investors and unless, investments unless you're an institutional or wholesale investor, um, or you've got minimums of five hundred or a million dollars, uh, five hundred thousand or a million dollars that you need to actually be a participant. Um, what LAFE, uh, the Lucerne Alternative Investments Fund, does provide is it's a retail product, so you don't have to worry about being a sophisticated or wholesale investor. Twenty-five thousand dollar minimum monthly liquidity, and um, the accessibility, of course, that that provides self-managed super funds is really important uh, into an alternative space that is typically reserved for the future fund or uh, industry super funds. I think what's really also important to self-managed super funds is obviously many which are in the pension phase and they're requiring that, that annual minimum pension payment. Yes. In a normal world, it's 5%, but it's less than that at the moment because of COVID. Um, what LAFE has the ability to do is also pay distributions on an annual basis. You know, last year, the fund paid a 10% distribution to investors. So we do realise returns along the way and pay them out. Um, accordingly, and that's why it's just another good diversifier in the portfolio. Look, thanks again for your time today, both Anthony and Michael, and for those insights into uh, the fun there. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.